Okay, thanks very much, Cam, and everybody who was uh, part of this organization, especially the students who are out there manning the booths and doing the posters. That was really terrific. And all of you guys for being here. So I was one of the first members of the Center for Neuroscience when it was founded, as Cam talked about, 22, three or four years ago. And uh, at the time, I was not at least been interested in aging. Being 30-something years old, why would I be? Um, and what I've learned over the course of the last seven or eight years that I've been involved in aging is that we call it aging. And, and that's because old is a moving target. When I got here, 50-something was old. And it's not at all old, it turns out, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and from what I gather, that just keeps happening the older you get. It's just, you never get older. Um, the, so I'm going to talk about aging in the auditory system, and what really uh, everybody wants is they want to be forever young. I mean, being young is great, as some of us may recall. And uh, the only way you really, that I know of, that you can be forever young is to die young, right? <laughs> that's, that's not a very good alternative. So what you have to do is, when you're young, you know, you're beautiful, and you're handsome, and you're muscular, and everything is going your way. And then as you get older, uh, middle age is so bad, right? I mean, you're on your game, you know what you're doing, you know who you are, and that can be okay, right? And then as time goes by, then you would come up with what we call it. <laughs> and, um, you know, you're not the same as you used to be, but if you have a good stylist, you there might be. Um, otherwise, you know, you really want to be here, but this is where you end up. Okay? And so, um, with aging comes a lot of good things, like experience and wisdom, etc., but some bad things too. Some of the one of the things that happens to most people <coughs> as they age is they get age-related hearing loss, and it's a major health concern. Okay, so it's the third leading <coughs> deficit in the aging, and behind arthritis and cancer. Okay, so and and these numbers are gross underestimates of the reality of the situation. Many people don't ever get treated or complain about it. But by the time you're 75, 80, 85 years old, almost everybody has some form of age-related hearing deficits. It's not necessarily that you can't hear very well, right? But it also means that it's very difficult for you to understand speech and voice. Okay? That's the major complaint. And usually the complaint comes not necessarily from the older person, but from their children and grandchildren, because they can't hear what you're saying, and it becomes annoying. So this next slide is one of my favorites. I don't know who these people are, I just got this off the internet, but this is a classic example of what happens to aged people who have age-related hearing deficits. What you have here is you have grandma interacting with Junior, making a hot dog or something, and it's very fun. And then you have mom looking on, being all momish. And here's dad, and here's, I don't know, with this teenage girl being affectionate to a father. That's totally fake. <laughs> But it looks good on this picture. And everybody's engaged here. And here's Gramps, and he's looking, and he's not really keeping up. Right? Just look in his face. He's like, uh, is that what's going on? Where's my hot dog? Right? And it's really difficult for these people to understand speech and noise. And that leads to bad things, right? What happens often is, and we do this all the time, you probably think that you understood every word that I said, okay? Or Charan, or, or John. You might not have understand everything that they said, but you think that you understood every word. But if I were to audio tape this and cut out the words and take them in completely out of context, all of us would make some mistakes, right? Did he say sped or read? Well, he didn't sped through the spotlight. He, you know, he, he sped through the stoplight. He didn't read through the stoplight, right? So we all hear sped, right? even though we could make these mistakes. And what happens <coughs> to these older people is that they do that more and more and more. So now they're building up this construct of this conversation that they think that they're having by changing the words that they're not really understanding. And before you know it, either the person they're talking to isn't making sense, or they ask a ridiculous question, right? Because they're thinking about something completely different. And what happens is you get embarrassed. And when you get embarrassed, if you're like me, you tend not to do things that embarrass you. Right? You're not always successful, but you tend not to like to do that which means that you don't interact very much with other people and you get socially isolated and depressed, etc. So what happens to hearing loss? There's four main factors that contribute to it. One is age, okay? which is one thing we can't really do much about. The other is what Cam alluded to, and that's noise trauma, which can be working in industry or it can be listening to rock and roll too loud or what have you. There's a number of drugs that can cause hearing deficits, okay? and there's genetics. <clears throat> okay, so the trick is to figure out, you know, what's the aging part, 
and, and what you can do about it and see if you can avoid getting age related hearing loss. Um, as Cam said, if you listen to loud rock and roll music like the Rolling Stones did for decades, that water's under the bridge, right? You can't get that back. Right? When they're dead, they're dead. <clears throat> So what I'm interested in is understanding what's going on in the ears and the brains of, of older people and hopefully find a way to get it so that either the hearing aids will work better or there's some other intervention you could do or that there's some good reason why or an understanding of how it is that these brains don't work as well. Anymore. And to do that, I use the macaque monkey as an animal model, much like John does. And he didn't show any pictures, but the macaque monkey is a... Uh, is a fine animal model. It's been used in neuroscience research in all kinds of different contexts. It's been used a lot in visual research. We understand most about our primate visual system due to the macaque monkey. Uh, monkeys I study are more like this. They're not that particularly bright. But what you see is that there's a big range of different kinds of animals. And they're very similar to us in very many different ways. Okay? And fortunately for me, and uh, just up the road here is the primate center that John is the, is the director of. And at the primate center, they have both young animals, this is a young cat, as well as a big geriatric colony. These are older. And they, geriatric monkeys are very much like um, geriatric humans. Okay? There's a lot of similarities between the two. And the trick here is to say if we can study these animals, we can do the kinds of studies that you can't do with humans. We can look at their brains in very different ways and see what are the similarities and differences depending on how young and old they are. Okay, so here, um, just by way of example, this is a, an older monkey, and uh, monkeys age what we can consider about three times as fast as humans. So a 25-year-old monkey is like a 75-year-old human. So the monkeys that I'm going to be talking about are, are going to span a long age, but when you get up into your 30s as a monkey, that's very, very old. And as you get older in a monkey, you have very many of the similar kinds of um, problems, mobility problems, for example, and arthritic problems, so it's hard for you to get around as much. That happens in monkeys. They have different kinds of cognitive deficits, too. And they can be cantankerous, much like elderly people can be cantankerous. Or not, right? And so it's actually a good working model to understand exactly, you know, how does the human brain actually work. And the advantage of going through the primate center is that we know that the monkeys haven't suffered any kind of hearing trauma, right? Mm -hmm. And we know exactly what pills they've taken, right? Because they have these <laughs> extensive medical records, and what we're left with is age and DNA. Okay. <clears throat> so hopefully, uh, we know all their parents, etc. So the studies I'm doing for, for now are really small, but hopefully we'll be able to use this genetic information as well and be able to better understand, you know, <coughs> different kinds of molecular mechanisms that can lead to this. So how do you study hearing in a monkey? So when people are studying hearing in humans, if you've ever been to the audiologist, like I have, they put on headphones and they give you a button and they say, when you hear the sound, press the button. Right? And what they do is they start playing sounds super quiet and it gets louder and louder and louder until you push the button and they say, that's your threshold for hearing. Right? And you can teach monkeys to do this, but it takes like one minute to teach a human to do this. It takes months to teach a monkey. Right? <clears throat> so who wants to spend months doing it? Certainly not me. Well, one thing that we can do instead is uh, shown in the next slide here, and that's use an auditory brainstem response. And this is something that they do to newborn infants all the time. It's really important to know if a newborn human infant can hear, because if it can't, then there's some interventions you can do so that can learn language, etc. But newborn infants are even dumber than monkeys, I guess, except for maybe charms. And you, if you say, hey, baby, can you hear? They don't act like they can hear, right? So what you can do instead is while they're sleeping, you put electrodes on their scalp, much like Charlie was talking about. You give them earbuds, and then you can play sounds and record the brain waves that Charlie talked about over time and see what are their brain waves when you're playing these sounds. And if there are, then the baby can hear. And we can do the same thing with the monkeys. You give the monkey um, something that makes them go to sleep, right? You put the, put the electrodes on, put in the earbuds, and you can play sounds, starting them quiet and getting them louder until you see the brain wave response. So when it's super quiet, you don't get one. When it gets louder, you get one. And you go, ah, that's what this animal can hear. Okay. <clears throat> and then they wake up and eat bananas in their okay. <laughs> so, um, so the next slide shows an example of these brain waves. <clears throat> and here you see, um, so this on the left, this is a, a young monkey. And the, on the right is an older monkey. And this is time on the x-axis. And what you're seeing here, each one of these is an individual brain wave. 
And uh, what's happening here is it's playing a, a noisy stimulus. It's called a click, 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 click. And um, this bump shows that, and, and there's a bump here, and a trough here, and a bump here, and a trough here. And that tells me that this animal can hear that sound of a click. Okay. And so then you go, okay, I'll make it quieter. Right? And so this is 70 dB. 80 dB is really loud, louder than I'm talking to you guys. And you come down here to maybe 60 dB, which is about what you guys are hearing me talk. You still see the bumps. 50 dB quieter, still the bumps. 40 dB, they're almost gone away. And by 30 dB, they're pretty much gone. Okay, so you'd say this monkey's threshold is 30 dB. Here's an older monkey, and you can see that the bumps aren't as big in the first place, if you compare them across, and the bumps go away at 40 dB, and so we'd be in the bottom of 30. Okay, so this monkey can't hear sounds as loud as the younger monkey. And I can do that, and I can say, okay, what's the threshold? Here's the threshold for this monkey, it's 30. Here it is, this monkey, it's 40. Let's map out all the thresholds from about, I think there was 56 different monkeys that we had access to, and that's shown in this one. And this has a couple of features to it that I think will might kind of look familiar to you. Charon was showing a lot of bunch of dots that kind of made a trend, right? And you see the same thing in this. What you've got here is the age in the monkeys, the monkeys on the left, the human equivalents on the right, so 30-ish, 60-ish, 90-ish, and one monkey that was super old that was about 105 in human years. And this is the threshold. And what you see is that young monkeys tend to have lower thresholds than old monkeys, but there's a lot of variability. And if I showed this to an audiologist and I said, I did this to a bunch of people in Davis, they'd say, that looks about right. <laughs> so humans, in, I mean, there's some, I've highlighted this spot here. This is a, a young animal that has pretty lousy hearing. And here's an old animal that has the same level of hearing, even though it's 20 years old. <coughs> and you see the same kinds of things in people. Right? Some people here in their you know, 60s or whatever can hear as well as much younger people, and others can barely hear at all. So what we did, what was really fortunate for us at the time, this was done by my graduate student several years ago now. And so we got all these data, and then we told the primate center that if any monkey is going to have to be euthanized for any reason, because it got sick, or it has cancer, or it got beat up, or whatever, let us know, and we'll go down there, and we'll harvest its brains, and see how does its brain chemistry or whatever relate to how well the monkey can hear. And we were fortunate enough to get nine of these animals. And we were really fortunate that they span a pretty broad range in age, and in hearing growth. So we took those nine, and we didn't just do clicks, we also did tones, so we could get the audiogram thingy just like the audiologist does. And that showed for these nine animals here, so the youngest one could hear really, really well, and the oldest one couldn't hear very well at all. And what you can do then, and what audiologists do, is they just take the average threshold for all of these tones, and get what's called the pure tone average, right? And that's shown in the slide here. And you can see that the pure tone average increases in these nine monkeys as a function of age. So these are the animals that we're going to study and ask, what is it about their ears and their brains that are different that give rise to these different um, thresholds, these different hearing losses? So what I'm going to do is go through uh, a handful of brain areas, and I'm going to do this kind of quickly just to give you a flavor for the kinds of research that we do. Okay, so the first thing we look at is the cochlea. So this maps out how you get sounds from the air into the, into the head, into the cochlea, and then up through the nervous system up to the cortex here, which is where you actually perceive. <clears throat> and so the trick here, the cochlea, is this really interesting part of the brain. This part does the balance, and this part does the hearing. And the next slide shows kind of what that's like. The cochlea is this snail-like thing, which is just a tube that's coiled up. And in that tube is a thing called the organ of cordy, which is shown right here, and that's where the neuron parts are. And so when you hear a sound, the, the, the um, the eardrum will vibrate and it will cause this wave of fluid to go through this thing here, which will cause this thing to move up and down. And, and it's going to move up and down more at, the, at one end for low frequencies and at the opposite end for high frequencies. And so that's basically how you hear stuff, right? And the way it works is you have these inner hair cells, and they're the ones that are going to transmit the information to the brain about what you hear. And then there's these three outer hair cells. And what they do is they modify how much it moves up and down. Okay, so they're like a little amplifier. And they don't actually tell the brain what the sound is. And then down here is the spiral ganglion cells. And these are the neurons that make up the white matter part in the nerve. And they're sending the neural impulses into the brain. And then there's another part that keeps everything all healthy. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to just look at these different parts. And what this is showing here, this is just the one. There's another set like this right here, and another here, and another here, and another here. And so there's thousands of these going around in this circle. Okay. Okay. So this is an electron micrograph of, the, of this part right here. Right? And I like to show this because this is really super hard to do. Right? So you, you, uh, my graduate student really busted himself to get this. But you can see really nicely, here's the inner hair cell. Here's the three outer hair cells. And what we did was we asked, OK, as a function of age, are these there or aren't they? Okay, very simple. Either there's the hair cell there or there isn't. And we also looked at the outer hair cells and asked the same question, are there three outer hair cells there or aren't there? Right? And then we can compare those as a function of age. Some animals had fine. They had all of them that looked just like, you couldn't tell how old it was. Others had some missing. We also looked at uh, these things here, the spiral ganglion cells. So these are the neurons that are going to tell you, tell the brain, what sounds you just heard. And if you look at these things, this is a nice picture but the light microscope level. And what you're seeing here, this is the spiral ganglion cells here. This is the big round thing with the nucleus in the middle. And these are nice, robust, healthy cells. These little ones here, these are glia, these are normal too. So this is a really normal looking um, spiral ganglion. We hope you all, all of ours look like this. Here's an example of a very bad one. I don't think that many of you are trained neuroanatomists. I think every one of us can see this looks good. If he says this is healthy, this looks good, this doesn't, right? I mean, there's things missing, okay? Like spiral ganglion cells, and they're small, and they're, and they're pretty, right? And finally, we also looked at this part here, which is stria vascularis, and this keeps the whole dang thing healthy. And so when we did this, we thought, what's probably going to happen is, this part is going to go south first, and then that's going to cause the outer hair cells to get damaged, and then the inner hair cells, and last will be the spiral ganglion cells. And that's what we predicted would happen as you get old. So we looked at the data, and that's not what happens. <laughs> not, I mean, it's one of those things. Now, now I, I can explain exactly why it's this, and I can act like that's what I thought in the first place, but of course, it wasn't. Okay? And what you look at here is if you ask how many things went wrong as a function of age, you see that the youngest monkey, everything was fine. Nothing was wrong with his cochleas. As they got older, one thing happened bad. In this case, it was um, inner hair cell loss. In this case, it was the stria vascularis. As they got older still, two things went wrong. And the oldest monkeys, three things went wrong. And this turns out to be really super important. Because here, I'm showing you again this pure tone average, the threshold. All these monkeys have about the same thresholds, but they have very different reasons why they don't hear as well. One has bad outer hair cells. This thing, this animal, uh, hearing aid would work great. And we all have examples of people that we know who have hearing aids that, that like them and other people who throw them under the bus because they just don't work. Right? This other animal here that has the same hearing deficit, its um, spiral ganglion cells were gone. And no, no matter how much you amplify the signal in the ear, if there's no cable to get it to the brain, it's not going to help. Right? And so this is a person who's going to throw his, his um, hearing aids away. <clears throat> and, and, and so understanding better which one of these maladies you might have is really going to be helpful. So just looking at the pure tone average isn't going to give you that information. <clears throat> okay, so from the end of this, what we figured was that these increased cochlear pathologies should result in decreased excitatory drive in the ascending auditory system. So what's coming into the brain from the ear is less. And as you recall, you get into the brain, so we looked here, you get into the brain way down here, and there's lots of neurons and lots of synapses and lots of pathways until you get up to where you can hear. So the next thing we asked was, is it, what's going on? So you have less coming in, what, does, what tries to compensate for that? So we looked across anatomically, and I'm just going to show you this really briefly. There's a whole bunch of different proteins that scientists think are important in how the nervous system functions. There's about, oh, for this kind of level of staining, et cetera, investigation, there's 20, 25 or something like that. We only had two that you could look at. Right? And so what you can do is you can take these chemicals. One is called NAD PhD and one is called, called parvalbumin, abbreviated PV. That's not important, but you can take them and see is there any difference as a function of age and how well you can hear at the expression of these proteins. And I'll give you a couple examples here in the cochlear nucleus. What you're looking at is a 15-year-old monkey and a 35-year-old monkey, and these dark spots are cells that are expressing this particular molecule, and these dark spots 
are expressing this molecule, and you don't have to be a trained neuroanatomist to say, I don't see any difference between these two, or these two, or these two, or these two, or these two. I see a difference here. There's a lot more black spots on this side than on this one. <clears throat> and we look through all kinds of different things. There's all these sophisticated ways that you can count cells. You can't just look at them and count them. You gotta do all these cool tricks. And if you do that, you see, yep, sure enough, there's a whole lot more of this expression in this molecule in this particular area, but not these other ones. And that was down here. We can look in this part of the brain and see a similar kind of thing. And in this case, there's lots of expression of this particular molecule and this one in these different areas. And you can move on and on. I can get a picture of the thalamus. And again, you see the <coughs> So what's happening here? What's happening is that you have this decreased drive. Yes? Is there a way to differentiate, you know, going back just a second ago, you talked about there was no connection for the, there was, there was non-existent cells that connected the, I forget the name of the structure, to the brain. So is there a way to differentiate that without, because you can't do that to a hu human, that for an audiologist or somebody to differentiate that to determine buying a hearing aid which is not covered by Medicare at 5,000 bucks a pop is a waste of our money and resources? Is, is there a way to... Um, <coughs> make, a, make a diagnosis that's uh, differentiate whether this will work or not work or help yes. somebody? Fortunately, there is. Okay, right? great. So the great. trick is if you go in and, you, and, they, and they do the hearing test thing and they say you've got a problem, you need a hearing aid, say let's look a little bit more carefully at this, right? And there's a, a handful of tools you can actually use. Okay, great. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so what we see is that there's changes in these cell densities of neurons expressing these different molecules, and we see that at every level of the ascending pathway. And the thinking that we have now is that this is an attempt by the central nervous system to try to fix the uh, lack of drive coming out of the cochlea. Okay, so what's the real scenario of what's happening here? <clears throat> when you're young, everything is working great. Okay? <clears throat> and then you start to get older, and maybe you listen to rock music or whatever, and you start having these cochlear pathologies start to crop up. Right? And what happens is then your brain, your brain stem and your, and your brain itself, is trying to compensate for this decreased input, and it does so by decreasing the inhibition. And it works. Right? So these guys don't have the age-related hearing loss yet. And then you continue to lose your hearing as you get older, and suddenly what's going on now is that you can't compensate anymore, and you start missing the words. And you end up like Gramps over here, who is having a real difficult time understanding what's going on. So the fix, the band-aid that the nervous system is trying to use to help with the hearing loss is starting to trash the system, right? And what happens when we look in the, the brains of these older animals as well, and the activity goes way up, right? And the sloppiness goes way up in your brain power, <clears throat> right? And that's what we see in older people, and then we see it in older animals, and we see it in older uh, monkeys or rats or whatever. So what's happening is you lose their ability to inhibit the bad stuff and all you end up with is all the noise, right? And that's why it's so difficult to understand speech and noise, because you hear everything. <clears throat> okay, so what can you do about it? Well, you know, don't listen to how loud rock and roll, et cetera. And everything that we've already heard earlier, all the sleep and exercise and all these things are all positive things that help tweak the system and keep it engaged. But what's really important is being engaged in this way. Okay? So, asked earlier, is online okay for social interaction? It's okay for social interaction, but it doesn't help intermittent hearing loss, obviously, because you got a one-on-one -on -one and hear these things. <clears throat> okay, I'll stop there and entertain any questions. Yeah. 